Our next speaker is a man from Texas. Of course, you know that the state of Texas is celebrated for many things besides its huge size. But I'm sure that when the true history of Texas is someday written, uh, the name of Dr. Shelton will assuredly loom large. Today, you might say he's a, a prophet that is not recognized in his own state. But for us who have studied his books, and he's written quite a number of them, we know that he is making and has made a distinct contribution to the valid health literature of this country. I know that in his work for the past 40 years, he has helped literally thousands of people back to a good state of health after the medical profession has virtually rejected them, has virtually told them that they could not do anything for them. I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Shelton under these auspices because he once told me that he began to be interested in the subject of health because he once picked up a tattered copy of physical culture. And I also want to take this occasion to pay reverence to Bernard McFadden, who really made a tremendous contribution to the uh, physical well-being of this country, which someday will be recognized in its true status. I want you to listen to Dr. Shelton because I feel that he will not only stir you emotionally and intellectually, but that he will go to the roots of the subject. And I'm sure that all of you will benefit from his talk tonight and the rest of the week. Dr. Shelton. <laughs> You know, I like to talk to my audience instead of the gadgets. But they got me imprisoned here tonight. This gadget also goes over to that recording machine. And I, I believe some of you have indicated your desire to get recordings, tape, and records of these talks. And they're being made there, so I'm going to have to talk to this machine and hope you will like what I say. A long time ago, I learned to think of life as a master drama of nutrition and drainage under the control of the nervous system. And this evening, I want to break that down into its three parts and discuss each one of them for you. <laughs> Listening to Dr. John Curcio just now, I realize that there's going to be a certain amount of overlapping of the things we say but I would like to impress upon you the importance of repetition in learning. So if I say something that is somewhat similar to what he said, maybe it will only fix in your memory a little more firmly the facts that we're trying to tell you. Now, what is nutrition? You think of nutrition as being food. Food is the material of nutrition. You do not think of a house. I mean, you do not think of the materials that go into the building of a house as the process of building. You think of those as the material. As you watch the workers, you see them with their tools and carrying on their activities, cutting and fitting and fastening the various pieces of lumber or brick or whatever else they're using into their proper places. You know that the workers are doing the building, not the building material. Now, food is building material. Food is nutriment, but it is not nutrition. Nutrition is a process, a vital process, a process of the living organism carried on by that organism, carried on by the organs of that organism. It is carried out by the many functions of that organism. It is the overall process by which raw materials are converted into living structure. This means that it is the process by which apples and pears and bananas 
uh, uh, pecans and other nuts and, and various vegetables and so forth that you eat as food, as raw material, are converted into cell structure or into blood and lymph and bone and muscle and nerve and glandular tissue. This is the process of nutrition. It begins in the mouth. It begins with the taking of food, with the chewing and swallowing of that food, with its insalivation, with the very first step, which is the chewing of the food. In the process of digestion, we may say properly that the process of nutrition begins. In the mouth, it is carried, the work is carried on by the mu muscles and the bony structures that are involved in chewing, and by the glands that secrete the digestive juices and in their enzymes in the mouth. Then the next step is the swallowing of the food, and it reaches the stomach, where other glands pour out their secretions, including their various enzymes upon that food. And it undergoes further changes while it is being moved through and fro in the stomach by the actions of the stomach muscles. After which it is poured into the intestine, where other juices from other glands and other enzymes from these glands are poured out upon that food, which make further changes in it. Then it is absorbed into the bloodstream and the lymph stream. It is carried by these. And this carriage is done primarily by the action of the heart. But there is also some other factors involved in the circulation of the blood and lymph which we need not go into because we are not dealing tonight primarily with a lecture on physiology nor a lecture on circulation. But it reaches the blood and lymph and there it is carried to the liver by these, where it undergoes further changes. The liver converts for example, the sugar that it receives from the intestine into a form of material that we know as glycogen or animal starch and stores it as such. The liver makes further changes in the proteins. It stores up some of the vitamins and some of the minerals and even some of the fat. The blood carries the food then to the rest of the body, to all of the cells and tissues throughout the body. And this work is done by the heart and the circulatory system. In other words, the whole digestive system, the heart and the circulatory system are part of the body's nutritive system. And the functions that these organs carry on are part of the process of nutrition. We're simply nutritive machines, so to say. The work that we carry on inside ourselves is the work of nutrition. But as Dr. Christio so em ably emphasized, it is not food that does that work. It is the living organism itself that is active, that carries on the work, that performs the functions that are necessary for the transformation of that food substance into cell substance. There are numerous glands in the body that we know as ductless glands that secrete substances that they pour into the bloodstream that we call hormones. And these hormones they don't do anything. They're tools that are used by the body. And you can stop the activities of that body by putting it under drug depression and give it all the hormones you want and there won't be any harmonic changes take place in the body. The actual work is done by that living organism and these hormones are merely tools that it employs in carrying on its work. But they are essential parts of the process of nutrition and they are produced by the living organism. Every step of the way that we go from the mouth to the cell, all the changes that take place and all the transportation of food from one part of the body to another and all the secretion of juices and enzymes that are requisite to the changes that take place in that food, we must credit to the activities or the actions of the living organism, the food does not produce the action. The food does not do the acting.
The food substance reaches the cells and the cells take up from the bloodstream as it, or the lymph stream rather as it passes along by them in, in a continuous flowing stream. It takes out from those substances the foods that it requires, that is the food elements, the food material, and incorporates it into, them, them, into themselves, produces, in other words, cell substance, living substance, if you will. Now, in the case of the plant, it actually takes the lifeless material of the soil and of the water and of the air and lifts it up into living substance. The production of living substance out of lifeless material is accomplished by the activities of the living plant. The, the uh, animal organism is not capable of doing that. The nutritive processes of the animal and of the plant are very different. The nutritive materials required from the plant by the plant, rather, and by the animal organism, are different. But the plant can actually transform lifeless material into living material. <clears throat> there are other factors involved in the process of nutrition than that of the digestion, as absorption, circulation, and assimilation of food material. And this calls into activity other organs and other functions. Vital to the process of nutrition is that of oxidation. And it is the respiratory system which takes air into the lungs, which is the most important feature of that respiratory system. Takes the oxygen from the air into the blood, and the blood carries that oxygen to all parts of the body where it is utilized by the cells, so that the lungs and the muscles of the chest and the bones of the chest are involved in the bellus work that enables us to take in the air and to force it out again are part of the body's nutritive system. Now please keep this in mind. Air, or oxygen rather, is taken to the cells by the same bloodstream that carries the food to the cell. And I might mention in passing that it is the same bloodstream that picks up water from the digestive system after you have taken it in one form or another and carries that water to those cells. And they also need water, which is part of the body's nutritive material. So we have the, digest the digestive system the respiratory system and the circulatory system with all their various parts and accessories and all the major and minor functions involved in that process as part of the process of nutrition. And yet there is another. We take in the rays of the sun through the skins of our body and we make use of those sun rays in carrying on certain functions that we cannot very well carry on without them. Now you will be told that the sunshine does thus and so to you. No, it's the other way around. You make use of the sunshine just as you make use of food and just as you make use of water. You are the active agent. Yours is the process of nutrition. <coughs> But the skin becomes a part of the body's nutritive system. All of the glands of the stomach and, of the, and the liver and the pancreas and, other, and the of the mouth that are involved in the production of digestive juices are part of the body's nutritive system. All of their functions are part of the overall process of nutrition. Now it is by this process of nutrition that we develop that we grow, that we maintain ourselves, that we maintain the daily wear and tear of our body, that we repair damages, wounds and broken bones, and that we reproduce ourselves. All of this is the work of the process of nutrition. 
so you understand how vitally important it is that we maintain ourselves in such a condition that the process of nutrition can be carried on in an ideal manner. By that I do not mean that we have to eat a certain way or eat certain foods or eat certain combinations of foods, but that we must live in such a way that we maintain a certain minimum or optimum rather, a certain optimum standard of physiological efficiency so that this process of nutrition can be carried on in an ideal manner. Drainage is in certain particulars part of the process of nutrition. But it is that process by which waste materials are carried away from the cells and tissues by which those, that, those waste materials are modified and detoxified and prepared for elimination, by which they are removed from the bloodstream, <coughs> and finally by which they are voided. We are in the habit, unfortunately, of thinking of the act of avoiding as the act of elimination. Before I go any further in this, in describing the process of drainage, I want to see if I can't disabuse your mind of certain popular fallacies concerning elimination. Many times I have said to people that their troubles are due to toxemia or to a toxic condition of the body. And they have said, well, what caused me to be toxemic? And I, I would say to them, check elimination. Oh, doctor, I am so badly constipated. Now, I didn't have any reference to constipation. Dr. Tilden made a very astute remark one time when he said the idea that constipation produces toxemia is a very constipated idea. <laughs> Elimination is the process of removing waste material from the bloodstream. The most important eliminating organs in the body are the kidneys and the lungs. Oh, there are others says the liver does quite a bit of work in taking waste matter from the bloodstream. And there are other organs involved in the work of elimination. But when the liver, when the kidneys remove waste matter from the blood, they pass it down into the bladder, where it remains for a few minutes to several hours before it is finally voided. Now, voiding, voiding is not elimination we void that which had been previously eliminated. Once it's in the bladder, it's out of the body. I will explain this more fully to you about why a thing is out of the body when it's in the bladder or in the colon when I come to discuss for you the development of toxemia and its results. Material that is in the colon Part of it was never in the body. It is undigested food that has been sent down from the small intestine into the colon, but was never in the body. Part of it is waste material that has been thrown into the colon from the bloodstream. But when it was thrown into the colon from the bloodstream, that was the act of elimination. When you have a bowel movement, that is the act of voiding. Then, of course, you have the idea that if you're toxic, uh, you have, the first thing to do is to free yourself of toxins, and the best way to do it is to stimulate the organs of elimination. How we love to stimulate things. <coughs> How we love to force matters. How we love to prick them and goad them and whip them and drive them with a lash. <coughs> so we go to have a nice little Turkish bath. 
a sweat bath with the idea that we're going to sweat out toxins. And we do. We really do. As a matter of fact, <coughs> we get out nearly a quarter of an ounce of waste matter when we sweat four gallons. Now imagine what you'd look like when you had lost four, four gallons of fluid from your tissues. The well-known dried prune would look like a well-filled plum to you <coughs> compared to the dehydrated state you would be in. Imagine losing four gallons of fluid from your tissues. <coughs> to lose a little bit of waste matter, you could have done better by missing a few bites at the last meal. Eat a little less and you won't have to waste your money on these kidding programs. Oh, I've given sweat baths in the past. I used to give them dozens of them a day in institutions I worked in when I first got out of college. We put those poor people in those sweat baths and the water ran out of them in streams, filled, accumulated in little pools in the bottom of the cabinet. And we poured water in at the other end as it went out through the skin. And all we were getting out was the water we were pouring in. <coughs> Drainage is the process of getting the waste matter away from the cells and tissues and getting it out of the body. Now, let's notice one of the wise provisions that old Mother Nature has made in this body of ours. I pointed out to you that the bloodstream and the lymph stream is the great vehicle of nutrition, or of nutriment, of food, and of water, and of air that goes to the cells. And it is that same lymph stream and that same bloodstream that is the great vehicle by which drainage takes place. In other words, the waste matter, as it's poured out by, by the cells, is poured into the lymph stream, and it is carried by that lymph stream back to the heart and dumped into the bloodstream and it becomes mingled with the blood and becomes part of the blood. So that the same circulatory system that is so important in drainage, uh, in nutrition, is equally important in drainage. And as that lymph flows along through the lymph channel, it passes through structures known as lymphoid, lymphadenoid tissue that filter out portions of it and chemically change it so that it is less toxic. As it passes through the liver, other changes take place in it. And finally, it reaches the kidneys where it is taken out of the body. Where the carbon dioxide is carried on to the lungs where it is expelled. Other material is taken out by the liver and made into bile and is used again. Not as a nutritive material, but to assist in the work of digesting food. For well, Mother Nature is a great economist. Some of the ductless glands secrete into substances that are important in the work of drainage or of chemicalizing the material that we drain. <coughs> Thank you. Now you will notice that the kidneys and the bladder and the various tubes associated with these and the colon and the liver and the gallbladder and the gall duct, and the lungs with the nose and the bronchial tubes and so forth. All of these structures are part of the body's drainage system, as are the heart and the arteries and the veins and the lymph vessels, all part of the body's drainage system. With, their, with all of these structures and their various functions involved in the work of drainage, it becomes evident to you that the process of drainage is almost as complicated as the process of nutrition. And it is equally as important as the process of nutrition. As a matter of fact, if, as Dr. Curcio made plain to you, if drainage is not adequate so that you become toxic as a consequence of the accumulation of waste material in the body, Nutrition cannot go on in a normal way no matter what kind of a diet you eat. That is the reason he emphasized, and that is the reason we're going to keep emphasizing all the way through this, this series of lectures, the importance of keeping the body clean, inside as well as out. 
Oh, you can scrub the outside with a, with a little water and, a, and brush. Or as my mother used to do me down on the farm with a corn cob and some ashes. <coughs> this was a long time ago, of course. <coughs> you can scrub the outside easily enough, but the inside, which is a self-cleansing thing, must do its own cleansing work. There are no blood purifiers except the liver and the lungs and the kidneys and the other organs and functions of the body that are involved in carrying on that work of drainage. These are the blood purifiers. And if you want your blood purified, you don't do it by eating special diets or so-called eliminating diets. You don't do it by taking drugs. You don't do it by taking sweat baths. You do it by getting out of the way and giving those organs of elimination an opportunity to do their work. Stop interfering with their activities. Cease doing the things that you're doing that are interfering with their normal activities. Cease putting a greater burden upon them. Give them an opportunity to do their work. They're the only things in, in this universe that can purify your bloodstream. Let them do it. I told you that the processes of nutrition and drainage were under the control of the nervous system. We're a rather complex body. That body is a unit. It starts out in life as a single microscopic cell. That little cell divides and becomes two, and the two divide and become four, and the four divide, divide and become eight, and the eight becomes 16, and the 16 becomes 32. You don't have to follow that very long until you see that you don't have to have many divisions in that fashion until you've got millions of cells. At first, they're all just alike. And then a process of differentiation sets in, and they, become, they take on different characteristics. Some of them become muscle cells and some gland cells and some bone cells and some become brain cells and nerve cells and so on and so forth. But that isn't enough. Just differentiating cells isn't enough to produce an organism. There must be organization and there must be unification. There must be integration. <laughs> now, our biologists and our physiologists and all are all very sure that they can explain every bit of this integrating process, all of this organizing and integration and so forth that takes place by physics and chemistry. I don't believe they can do it. I think there's more to life than the dust to which you can powder this body after you kill it and dry it. And because we can't find, it, find anything more in that powdered dust, I don't believe that means that there wasn't more there in the living organism. <clears throat> Nonetheless, that organism grows as an integrated unity from the microscopic cell to the complete adult man and woman. And it functions as an organism, not as a collection of organs. As a matter of fact, we are say, justified in saying that there is no such thing as a heart apart from the body. It's part of the body and separated from the body, and it's not a heart any longer. Separate the brain from the body, and it's no longer a brain. Separate the liver from the body, and it's no longer a liver, and it's not only no longer these organs, they, they don't function anymore. <laughs> They're soon just a stench. Oh, you can eat them. <clears throat> People do. They eat all, they bury all kinds of dead, or carcasses of dead animals in their bodies, in their bellies, I mean. How they love their carcasses, their graveyard diets. <clears throat> you could eat them. Well, the brain and nervous system is a special part of the body that is the master control system of that body. Now the circulatory system is involved in that control. And the glandular system is involved in that control, but we must not forget that both the circulatory system and the glandular system are controlled by that nervous system. 
Now that nervous system consists of the brain with 12 pairs of cranial nerves, of the spinal cord with 32 pairs of spinal nerves, and of the so-called sympathetic nervous system, which is largely inside the trunk, with all of its various plexuses and its many ramifications, and it all constitutes actually one vast nervous system. We don't have two nervous systems, we have one. So we have, may have, say we have two divisions of that nervous system, one of them which pro controls primarily uh, the activities of the organs within the trunk, the lungs, the heart, the, the liver, the kidneys, the pancreas, the uh, stomach, and so forth, and the other which controls the muscles and skin, the eyes, the ears, and those, the external parts of the body, and those parts that uh, connect, uh, connect us with the outside world. But they function as a unit. And so completely and thoroughly does this nervous system ramify every part of your body that if it were possible by some kind of a magic process to melt every tissue in the body except the nervous tissue in the nervous system determines the efficiency of the functions of the organs of your body. Tomorrow night, I'm going to discuss for you the many means the many ways in which we lower our nervous energy and lessen the efficiency of that nervous system and make it impossible for the nervous system to properly control the functions of life. Now, when I said the nervous system is the master control system, I do not want you to think by that means that it is the only part of the body that is important. The nerves, the nervous system cannot have any effect upon lifeless matter. Only living structures can respond to the nervous control. Muscle is capable of contracting without nerve pump, nerve control. You can sever a piece of muscle from a freshly killed animal or from it. Our, our uh, other sub, other in, uh, in animate things, and in many ways cause it to contract. I, I have thrown salt on it and so, made it it contracted as a consequence of the irritation of the salt. You can pass an electric current through it and it will contract. Or you can make it contract with heat. Those of you who used to uh, go frog hunting in your boyhood days and used to eat frog legs. I will remember that when you put the frog legs into the skillet of hot grease, they would jump out of the skillet. The heat would cause them to contract violently. They can contract without nervous control, but they don't. I mean, normally and ordinarily, they don't. If the nerve to your arm is paralyzed, if that nerve is severed or if it's destroyed by some pathological process, that arm is helpless. It merely withers away. You can't make the slightest use of it. The muscles don't maintain the development they have. They just gradually shrink away until all you have left is skin and bones. It's still alive, but it's as useless as if it were just a, a piece of rag hanging on your shoulder because the nerve impulses no longer are reaching the muscles of that arm. If the nerve impulses of the body do not reach, of the nervous system do not reach in the other organ, it also ceases to function. So it is necessary in order that we maintain good health that we have a, an efficiently working nervous system. Now upon what factor or factors does the efficiency of that nervous system depend? Let us not think of, of the body as a kind of one-way street by which nerve impulses flow into the various parts of the body and everything goes along lovely and there's no exchange going back uh, that keeps that nervous system in good condition. It's a two-way street. The condition of the nervous system depends primarily upon what you are doing with your body or to your body to maintain the whole body, including the nervous system, in a state of good health. Now, it is vitally important that we maintain or that we live in such a way as to maintain the process of nutrition at the highest pitch of efficiency, that we maintain the process of drainage 
at the highest pitch of efficiency and that we maintain the control mechanism of our body in the very finest physiological condition to the end that we may have health, not be able to merely to drag through the, through the day like most people do. I, I know you meet the average person on the street and you say, hello, John, how are you? And he says, oh, I'm feeling fine. When actually, if you pin him down, you'll discover he's suffering with hemorrhoids. Or that he took an aspirin before he left home that morning because he had a headache. Or that he had some Alka-Seltzer because he had a sour stomach with gastric distress. Well, naturally he would after eating kind of a breakfast that Dr. John uh, Curcio quoted a while ago coming from the book. And that breakfast is just about the same breakfast that the majority of people all over these United States have every morning. I think about the only thing we need to add is a dish of food. Well, it's true enough that some of them have a cup of coffee. And after a breakfast like that, they need a cup of coffee. <coughs> Without the coffee, they'd go to sleep before they got to their job. That isn't the kind of health I have in mind. I want you to have vigorous, pulsating health. Something that enables you to get out of the bed in the morning with a bounce. And face the day with courage and determination. Without an eye-opener. The healthy person doesn't need an eye opener. He doesn't need a cold bath and he doesn't need a little toddy. And he doesn't need a cup of coffee. Or he doesn't need any of these poisonous substances to force him through the day. I remember I used to get up early in the morning and go downtown when I worked on the staff of the New York Evening Graphic. I'd go down to the graphic office while people were going to work on the subways. Uh, and there they were fooling with their newspapers and smoking their cigarettes very nervously and they'd get out of the subway and run up the steps and run into the nearest hash joint uh, and order curlers and a cup of coffee. And there they'd sit, reading their paper, drinking their coffee, smoking their cigarette and, and eating the hole in the donut. Now I said they ate the hole in the donut for the reason that that's all there was left of the stuff that they were eating. So much of the nutritive materials had been separated from the wheat that out of which that donut was made that there wasn't anything left but the whole. And they eat that and then they hurry off to work. Well, a few minutes later they had to have another cigarette. And a little later another cigarette. Then they went out for a coffee break. I used to wonder when they were going to have a work break. At noontime, well, we won't go into their noon lunch. It usually consisted of a lot of hash with some coffee or a glass of beer. Then they had their cigarettes and their coffee or their Coca-Cola through the afternoon and a similar evening meal. Then they ran home and they got a bath and some more beer and some more cigarettes. And then they went down to the ball game or to the theater or to the bridge party or they went somewhere else where they ate and they drank and they came home at night and they had, an after, had a nighttime lunch or snack with some more cigarettes and some of them would get up at nighttime out of their sleep, get up and have some more to eat or some more smoke. Then they had to have an alarm clock to wake them up in the morning. They had to dynamite their colons to have a bowel movement. They didn't have energy enough to have a bowel movement without dynamite. Well, uh, you've got a lot of places here in the States uh, devoted to the care of nervous cases and uh, mental cases. What do you think causes it? All of this mental and nervous trouble. Oh, it's due to old work. He worked so hard. <laughs> uh, they've been warning me for 30 years to stop working so much. I only put in 16 hours a day. Once, once the man wrote to me and he said, we need a college of natural hygiene, Dr. Shelton, and you are the logical man to conduct it. And my secretary read the letter and she said, yes, you ought to have something to do the other eight hours. And I've never had a nervous breakdown. I may be crazy, I don't know. Uh, 
but I haven't had that nervous breakdown yet. And I only, as I say, I only put in 14 hours a day. In other words, I get in two eight hours a day. I get in two, uh, two, week, two weeks' work every week. I, I don't get uh, off for Sundays and holidays. In 36 years, I haven't had a vacation. I can't call this a vacation because while well, there's been two or three days I've been laying around here, uh, there's work to do. I don't believe that it's overwork of the kind that people have in mind when they use the term. I believe they're overworking themselves all right, but they're doing it with that one meal a day they eat. You know, we used to pride ourselves in this country that we eat three meals a day, three square meals. Well, we've cut that out. We all eat one meal a day now. We start in in the morning when we get up, and we finish eating about the time we go to bed at night. Yeah, one meal a day. We eat like a cow. We eat all day long. <clears throat> and we take our cigarettes and our coffee and our Coca-Cola and our beer and our other poisons along with it. We're overworking ourselves. We're overworking our digestive system and we're overworking our eliminative system. Not because we do a little work in the office or in the shop. Ye gods, my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather, on back to the time before the Civil War, uh, they worked on farms. They were farmers. Well, some of my father's were grand grandparents were slave owners. They didn't do any work, but at a later time they worked. Slave owners lived off the labor of the slaves. Their luxury was paid for by the effort of others. <coughs> but... Those that did work, they got up at 4 o'clock in the morning and they were out in the fields. They did all their chores, the feeding of, the, of their cattle, the milking of the cows, the feeding of the hogs, the feeding of the horses, the hitching up of the horses to the plows or to the wagons. They were out in the fields by the time it was dark, light enough for them to see. And they worked until it was too dark to see at night and then they came in and did their chores after, in the dark by lantern light in the barn and around. And then they went and had their evening meal and went to bed. <coughs> well... Some of them lived to be over 100, and very few of them died under 95. I believe my father is the only one who, lived, who died under 90. And uh, he, was, he lacked 30 days being 80 when he died. He never had a nervous breakdown. That, but those old fellows worked. And they never complained of being breaking down from overwork. Oh, you're overworking yourselves all right but it's not because you're doing too much for the boss. There's a fellow standing out here in the wing making faces at me. I think he wants me to shut up. So <laughs> let me urge all of you to be present tomorrow evening. I know what I'm going to talk about. I don't know whether Dr. Curcio knows what he's going to say or not. <laughs> but at any rate, be present to hear us anyhow. Tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening. <laughs> Uh, I hope that uh, as a result of Dr. Uh, Shelton's talk, you won't give up all your bad habits because we'd like you to hear him lecture during the rest of the week as well as Dr. Jean Curcio. We're going to have some questions now. Uh, you can address your question either to Dr. Shelton or Dr. Jean Curcio, about 20 minutes. Can I have the first question? Well, that's why we've left that for the, uh, uh, this lady asked, this lady states that uh, the lecturers have emphasized what one must not do, and she'd like to know what one should do. Yes, go on You're the chairman, I'm the since Dr. Curcio is not here, he's coming, but I'll, I'll try to answer that question. She, the lady complains that we have told you what not to do. We haven't told you what to do. First, I'd like to emphasize this fact. Sometimes it is more important to know what not to do than it is to know what to do. But I'd like to point out one other thing. There are 
10 days of these lectures with two lectures each day. We can't tell you everything tonight. <laughs> we'll do our best to get it all in in the next 10 days. If you'll come to all of these lectures, we'll try to get you so crammed full of knowledge about what to do as well as what not to do that you'll go home running over with it. Yes, I'm afraid that after they get through, they'll be out of practice because uh, you probably know as much as they will. What's the next question? Anybody ask a question? Yes. With beer? Beer. Yeah, you take care of that. Here's the next, uh, Dr. Gian Curcio is the next beer drinker. <laughs> the next saloon keeper. My father did have a saloon. I remember uh, finding a gun in a bedroom one time and in his drawer, and uh, he told me what well, he had to have a gun when he had the saloon. Well, I sold it. I was afraid the thing would go off, and I pawned it, and I bought uh, The Art of Living Long by Cornaro <laughs> with the money I got from it. Uh, well, what's wrong with uh, drinking? What, what did you say? What's wrong with it, or what's right with it? Well, now, it's not so much what's wrong with it, and there's plenty wrong with beer, but the reasons for your drinking. That is the basic inadequacy. In other words, the person who drinks beer or takes things of that nature is constitutionally inadequate or insufficient and resorts to beer and other things of that type simply because of basic defects, personality, physiological defects, uh, biochemical changes, the glandular changes. It's a composite of changes that indicate a alteration in behavior that is perverse. Now, I don't mean to insult you because you may be a beer drinker, but I'm assuming you're not. And you probably... He's willing to be. But <laughs> many of the things that we talk against, uh, perhaps if they were done once, uh, we wouldn't be too much alarmed about them. But we are alarmed about mm -hmm. the pattern within the organism that makes necessary all these things that are wrong. So beer drinking is wrong and coffee drinking is wrong and smoking is wrong simply because it gives vent to a whole disordered type of constitution that needs to be corrected. So we'd like to stop these evil patterns of action so that we can be begin renovating the individual. But beer in itself has many things that are wrong and that isn't enough. I mean, we don't need to go into that because that in itself does not answer the problem. And these alcoholics that I've had, it's always the need to make them aware of the constitutional defects that brings about the reformation in these people. <clears throat> Any other questions? Was that again? Did you hear that? Repeat the question. If I heard the question correctly, it was, did she understand Dr. Shelton to say that nervous tension was due to overworking the body? Uh, I don't think I even mentioned the term nervous tension. I did discuss overworking the body, but I did poke fun at the idea that with our 40-hour weeks and our eight-hour days, and are shirking rather than working that we do today that we are overworking ourselves. That, that we are actually overworking ourselves by our poison habits and by our excesses and indulgences of one kind or another, which we are carrying out to a greater extent than our forebears did at any time within the past recorded history. Overwork could produce nervous tension, but there are many causes or many factors that could produce and do produce nervous tension. It, it's possible to become very tense uh, from, by going out and indulging in a wrestling match for a couple of hours without rest, and sometimes you're so tense you can't sleep afterwards. And that might be said to be from, do, from overexertion, or overwork in other words. But the, the nerve tension that people suffer with today is 99 times out of 100 not due to the kind of overwork that people mean when they use that term overwork. I just want to uh, mention this very interesting aspect of this uh, seminar. 
We have about 40 people in the audience who are, are not registered for this seminar. Now, I might suggest if you wish to really put uh, the teachings of Dr. Shelton and Dr. G. and Curcio into effect, even for a few meals, that you uh, have your meals served commencing tomorrow, let's say, along the lines of the hygiene and, and watch the effect and see whether uh, the uh, type of meals that the other people are eating, the hygienists, are really beneficial. I think it would be a, a very good experiment and I'm sure that you won't miss very much of your other food. I mean, the effects of this meals that we're being served, I am positive, may convince you that there is real merit to the teachings of these two lecturers. So you can have that suggestion, and I'm sure the management will be very happy to uh, transfer you to this type of meal. Any other questions? What's that? Did you hear that? I didn't hear that. Will you repeat the question, please? Did you hear it? Before answering the question, another, uh, in, in addition to what Mr. Gould has said, uh, we have there a, a table with an attractive lady sitting there. You should order some of the books because uh, these books would give you all of the inspiration and infor information. I'm not selling books. But I feel that without this added knowledge, I mean, this lady that wanted to know what to do in a positive sense can get an encyclopedia of health by purchasing one or two of those books. And you men who want to uh, be more informed at the same time meet a very attractive person, here's an opportunity to, uh, uh, to buy a few books and at the same time get acquainted with a real example of health. Now this question about breakfast. I think the best breakfast is a glass of water and some fresh air. <laughs> I, uh, well, now, <laughs> working person. Well, I believe Dr. Shelton is a working person. I know I do a lot of work, at least I think I do, and I find that I tried eating breakfast for a while, and I got to the point where I didn't care if I worked. Uh, I've been eating twice a day since 1930. And just the addition of orange juice, in my case, is enough to make me sluggish and produce a certain amount of, of ineptitude uh, and mental fatigue uh, early in the morning. Uh, contrary to what we are taught, that you must have that lift even at 10 o'clock, in addition to breakfast, in order to have the mental power that we need. I also want to eliminate this notion that what we eat in the morning that gives us energy during the day. Now many of us are so loaded with junk and eliminate so much during the night and we wake up with the furred tongue and the stench in our breasts and we have to take something into that intestinal tract to stop this process of decomposition or ejection of the evil supper that you had. And you feel better, not because the stuff you took into your body has any value in a positive sense, but simply because you stop that detoxicating action that is going on or has been going on during the night. So you get a lift, more or less, from the not uh, going through of this cycle of change that is very constructive. I had a man that told me that he had to eat breakfast because he couldn't work in the morning he had this brain fag and he had these uh, changes that made him irritable and grouchy and he found that he was arguing most of the day simply because he didn't have that stabilizing influence in his stomach. Now, that breakfast did him no good probably until the next morning. So it couldn't have been of any value nutritively. The, the idea that the meal you take into your stomach does you good almost the minute you take it or even hours afterwards is wrong. The strength that you get during the day comes from the meal that you had the day before or, the, or even the day before that. I mean, it's a composite of changes that you undergo through eating properly over a course of, say, uh, days. And that immediate meal has been the uh, floundering point in many of our conce concepts of strength and energy. As though the meal gives energy and gives you strength, it does just the opposite. 
It takes energy and takes strength. And the lift that you get is dynamic and it's stimulating, just like coffee might be. But the secondary activity that goes on is very depleted. And for that reason, you resort to more meals and more drinks, as Dr. Shelton ably put it. It's one cycle of stimulation simply because of the depression that comes from the prior intake. I guess that's enough. How much time? Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I just want to emphasize again what Dr. Jean Curcio said. I really should have brought your attention to it. Dr. Shelton is a very voluminous writer, and he has covered the subject of health and disease perhaps as thoroughly as any man in this country, perhaps in the world. And uh, luckily, he has reduced some of his writings to pamphlet form so that those who don't want to invariably outlive their husbands. I think there's a great deal of statistics to support that. Well, once uh, I heard of somebody, that is a friend of mine, heard of somebody, a man that actually outlived his wife. And he was very curious to find out just how this gentleman had accomplished this extraordinary upset of statistics. And so he took the trouble to visit this man and interview him. And he said, can you explain to me how this phenomena has occurred that you outlived your wife? He said, uh, it was this way. When I married my wife, we had a premarital agreement that if there was an argument if the atmosphere was sort of uh, heated, I was to uh, leave the premises and walk around till things cooled off. And so he said, I lived practically an outdoor existence. <laughs> <laughs> now, are there, <laughs> are there any husbands here who have outlived their wives? Any other questions? Yeah. And the doctor is a very good doctor. The guy was two years old. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Shelton, uh, from the point he was uh, uh, described as uh, someone walking with a child like that. Before I try to answer the question, I'd like to correct something. This man said the doctors are afraid to cut it. I'd like for you to understand that the word physician properly applies to those who treat their patients with poisons. The word physician comes from the Greek physis, meaning drug, and ischian, meaning one learned in or skilled in. A physician is one learned in or skilled in the art of drugging. A doctor is a teacher. The word doctor comes from the Latin docere, meaning to teach. Now, don't call a man who treats patients with drugs a teacher. Call him by the name that he logically and legitimately ought to have a physician. And the mere fact that he's afraid to cut shouldn't disturb us. Let us, on the contrary, be happy that he is afraid. I mean, for the sake of the child. Because the probability is he'd kill the poor child in the cutting process. If he didn't, he'd do some damage that would call for another cutting process. The end would be a, a wreck, if not a funeral. Uh, I'd like to tell a story. Must be a good one. To illustrate what takes place when these fellows handle their patients. A wealthy New Yorker visited England, uh, visited Europe a number of years ago. And he bought a lot of souvenirs. You know how these souvenir collectors are. He brought back a whole trunk full of souvenirs. And he landed at the dock, and he got a truck man to carry the trunk up to his apartment on Riverside Drive. And he told the truck man, when you get up there, the butler will show you where to put the trunk. So he got there and he put the trunk on his shoulder and he got up the steps and he rang the bell and the butler met him at the door and he said, where do you want me to put this trunk? And the butler says, take it up upstairs there. So he took the trunk upstairs and he set it down and he came down and he said to the butler, why do you mock me? 
And the butler says, I, I didn't mock you, I stutter myself. <laughs> and the drayman said to him, he says, you, you come and go with me, me, me. I'll, I'll take, you, take you to a man that'll cure you. He cured me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to end on this note, and we hope to see you all tomorrow afternoon when uh, Dr. Jean Curcio will lecture on a very remarkable subject, and Dr. Shelton in the evening. What's that? What time? About 2.30. 2 o'clock in the afternoon and uh, 8 o'clock in the evening.